to Winner Take All. I'm Alex Mozed, where we talk about the constant battle to fight back and win against big tech. Really excited to have special guests with us today, Jonathan Nee. Jonathan is the author of The Platform Delusion, Who Wins and Who Loses in the Age of Tech Titans. He's also a professor of finance and economics at the Columbia Graduate School of Business, senior advisor at Evercore Partners, and before joining Evercore, he was managing director and co-head of Morgan Stanley's Media Group. Uh, Jonathan, great to have you with us today. Thanks for joining. Thanks for having me. We've also got Nick Johnson, uh, co-author with me on our book, Modern Monopolies. Uh, Nick, also, thank you for joining. Excited to be here. Should be a great conversation. You know, you'd think it'd be kind of a funny pairing, right? Uh, we wrote a book about modern monopolies and platform business models being you know, many of the things that it, when, you, when you read the initial kind of cover and overview of your book, Jonathan, Platform Delusion, you know, you'd say, hey, I think, I think there's going to be a lot of fireworks on this interview, which, you know, when you actually get into it, interestingly enough, there's a lot of areas that I think there's actually a lot of overlap on. But why don't we start with what are, what are some of those, I don't know what you would qualify them as, um, like overgeneralized stereotypes that, that you knocked down uh, pretty successfully. You know, why, why don't we maybe start there? Those are some fun things that you, you start off with. Well, I mean, look, there, broadly, there are two uh, myths uh, that actually are at, at war with each other, although strangely, uh, often people uh, embrace both of them simultaneously, even though they're inconsistent, uh, that relate to the misuse or misunderstanding of the, of the word platform and the, the notion of platform business models. One extreme uh, myth is this notion uh, uh, of the inevitability that the world will soon be taken over by a handful of dominant platforms that are just as we speak sucking up more and more of of the of the uh, of the uh, collateral damage of of the rest of the world uh, and those guys are just going to own everything so that's sort of one narrative then there's this other narrative that's just about how incredible any business that's a platform by its nature is and therefore start a platform because all platforms are great they all in have this fabulous uh flywheel effect and they're all going to do incredibly so you should invest in start whatever platform businesses and um and there's never been a better time to be an entrepreneur because platforms make it you know, it used to be hard. Now it's easy. Just start a platform. Um, you know, there are there, there are a couple of professors at Harvard who wrote a book recently called I think it's Competition in the Age of AI. And they they essentially argue both of these things at the same time. And uh, you don't need to be uh, an economist or a strategist or or much of anything to realize if there are five or six guys who are going to take over the whole goddamn world, this doesn't feel like it'd be a good time to be an entrepreneur to try to start something new. Uh, and conversely, if it were that easy to just enter any old market and make a platform, how strong could these incumbents really be? Uh, so those are the kind of ideas that are out there that I try to peel back and focus on what, as I, I actually do agree with you, focus on what the uh, the bulk of your book is about and the bulk of my book is about, which is saying that something is a platform. And I think your audience knows actually what a platform is, which is a business that isn't actually making some shit. It's connecting people or it's enhancing those connections. And it's their value. Their value proposition is about creating and enhancing connections. So those business models. So once you've identified something as a platform business, this is not the end. <laughs> this is the beginning of the analysis. 
That's really the moral of the story. And there are some horrible platform businesses and there are some great ones. And the interesting conversation is the conversation about what are the qualities that lend themselves to great and what are the qualities that lend themselves to shitty? Um, and that is the interesting question. And there are very few that are really winner take all markets, very, very few. And even the really, really good ones have their own vulnerabilities. And it's and it's worth it's worth looking at, uh, looking at those as you think about how it is that you could actually be a successful entrepreneur and exploit those vulnerabilities. Another interesting point, Jonathan, I think you make very well in your book is that, uh, you know, just because something is a platform, that doesn't mean it's also not it doesn't also incorporate these kind of traditional opponent uh, sort of supply side economies of scale, um, as we would call it, sort of having linear components to the business as well. You can be a platform business and a traditional business and combine those two things together. Um, and that can happen. And, you know, that could be 90, 10, 50, 50. Though there's a lot of different ways to combine these together. And uh, it's not just you're only a platform and that's it in many cases. One of the underlying uh, fallacies is that if it's a platform, again, it, it, it seems logical. If you're a platform, if the whole business model is based on making connections and having a network, well, it must have network effects. Uh, and first of all, that turns out not to be true. And secondly, even if there are network effects, that doesn't mean that it's great. <laughs> uh, people don't re people forget that the relevant actual competitive advantage is called scale <laughs> and scale is not an absolute concept it's a relative concept so it's about being bigger than your competitors in your sector it's not about being gigantic if you're in an industry that has a lot of gigantic people you're all going to compete against each other and it's going to be a shitty business okay but if you are bigger than the next person there are certain qualities that can make it a very good business. One of them is network effects, because as, as you know, uh, with network effects, every additional network participant makes the product better. That is uh, uh, the opposite side of supply side, that's demand side, that's uh, uh, benefits of scale. Um, but again, it's not network effects in itself. If you say, oh, I've got network effects, it must be good. Well, if you've got network effects and you're the smallest person in the industry, that's called a competitive disadvantage, right? That it, it's not, it just saying network effects doesn't help you. It only helps you if you are the biggest. And to your point, Nick, it actually, for some reason, I, I don't know, people, maybe it's a macho culture we lived in. People like to sort of set up a, a, a fight between this kind of, advantage and that kind of advantage uh, as if that's like a relevant conversation. So people often focus on what's better network effects or traditional scale advantages on the supply side. As you say, Nick, the source of those overwhelmingly are when a business model has significant fixed costs. And if there are significant fixed costs, and again, you are bigger than everybody else, well, you're able to spread those across more folks. And so your average cost is going to be lower and you're going to have an advantage. Uh, and people are like, well, you know, network effects are better. That's the modern version of scale advantage. So they're better than the, uh, that's not how, how to think of it. <laughs> you want to think about what's a great business. And honestly, the best businesses are businesses that have network, the best network effects platforms businesses are ones that have meaningful fixed costs so that the break even market shares before for, for you to be able to uh, uh, make a living are high enough that there aren't going to be a lot of competitors. If there are no fixed costs and you can have a whole bunch of anybody can start a platform and there isn't a lot of customer captivity, you're just going to have a bunch of competing platforms where folks are basically bribing participants from one platform to come to yours and back and forth, which frankly, 
That is, that's why Uber and Lyft will never make that much money. <laughs> they are network effects businesses, but to the extent that they're not terrible businesses, it's because they do have significant fixed costs and they're <laughs> and break even economics ensure that it's just the two of them, at least in, in most US markets, it's not true globally where it really is a terrible business, but the fixed costs because of the regulatory and everything else and the, uh, is such that there are only two. And so they're going to start making money when they stop bribing their drivers every Monday with new ridiculous, uh, you know, oh, if you, if you, I'll give you a hundred dollars if, if you don't sleep for five days and only ride for us this week. And, you know, they say, okay, great. I'll do you this week. And then next week, the other one offers a more ridiculous thing. And similarly, while I'm when I'm trying to figure out who I'm going to go to the airport with, when I get the little pop up that says, go to the airport free with Lyft today because we love you so much. I go with them. And the next time I go with Uber, that's not a good business. Right. And yes, it's a network effects business. But to the extent that it is got no reinforcing barriers to entry. Right. It's not going to be a great business. And the only extent to which it is a good business is frankly, not because of the network effects. It's because of the fixed costs that ensure that there aren't 10 of them. It's just the two of them who will eventually figure out how to stop shooting themselves in the foot. And you make the comparison, Jonathan, in your book from uh, Airbnb as a different example to Uber right. and why Airbnb is better because they're not creating these micro markets in every city where there, there's very little spillover on an Uber or Lyft between, you know, a New York and a Los Angeles, whereas Airbnb has this more kind of global traveler. So the network effects spillover that you have and the structure of that network is actually much more beneficial. I think that's right. I, th I think another, so if standing way back, if you ask yourself, how do you compare when you think about a network, when you think about a platform business, what are the things that are really going to drive whether it's good or bad? And I'll put it into two, two broad categories. One is the stuff or the purpose of the network. That is, what is it facilitating? What is the nature of the interaction that is facilitating? And there, if it's something very simple, and has very few distinguishing characteristics, a commodity, whether that's a service or a product, if it's a marketplace, that's bad right. <laughs> because like it turns out- Point A to point B. That's like, right, exactly, Uber. I mean, what do you, you only care what it costs and how fast the car is gonna get there, right? Yep. But Airbnb, if I'm gonna go to, if I want to be in the seventh arrondissement in Paris for my one week off, every I care about the view. I care about what's you know what what, what uh, cafe is in uh, is on the ground floor and which block it's in. I care about how many rooms. I care if there's air conditioning. I care if there's maid service. I care about a thousand different things. And interestingly, every new apartment that is comes on to the seventh Romney small makes the product better. It doesn't, it doesn't tap out. Oh, there are five apartments. Good. I don't need any more with Uber. Once I have enough cars on the platform that I can get one in five minutes, adding new cars doesn't do anything for you. Actually, it probably, if you get too many, it hurts you because if you're up on the 42nd floor and the car is going to be there in five seconds, because they have so many, you're going to miss it and they're going to charge you. Right? So the nuance of the product, the complexity of the product actually is very, very important. And, and if you just sort of think about it, you know, the, the, the way that the platform can be useful and add value, there are more ways, the more nuanced the pro the underlying uh, product is the second piece though that is equally important is the structure of not the products themselves but the participants in the network that the platform is connecting and marketplace businesses which is one kind of platform right with buying and selling people often talk about many to many, you want to be in a many to many market. And in general, 
if you think about it, if you're in the business of sucking value out of the ecosystem by being the connector rather than the provider of the service or, or one of the principles in the service, you're going to be able to do that if it's a very fragmented environment. Because, but if one side or other of the marketplace or of the ecosystem is dominated by a handful of people, those people are going to say, wait a second, why are you getting all of this vig off of this in this ecosystem where I am the main guy. If I'm not here, there's no party. So you either got to share that value with me or I'm going to set up my own goddamn platform. I can hire a few software developers and I can do a platform and I'm, and I'm a fabulous anchor tenant for my platform. So you either need to share more value with me or, uh, uh, or I'm going to set up a competing platform. So, in fragmented marketplaces, you are much more, uh, or environments, you're much more likely to be able to make money. But that can be a little misleading because when you think about many to many, you think about who's the end user uh, at, at the end of the day on, on any side. And, th and that doesn't tell you the whole story because the other issue that is critical is if the nature of the structure of that market lends itself to people disintermediating on either side. So let me tell you, give you uh, the one example in the book uh, uh, is, um, you know, the, the first large cap um, fintech company was uh, Lending Club. And it was the biggest IPO, Goldman Sachs led uh, tech IPO in 2014. It may have been the big, biggest IPO overall. And the basic story was, this is perfect. This is, you know, uh, Alex wants to lend, you know, Alex wants to borrow money and he doesn't want to tap out on his credit card uh, at 18%. And Nick, no, Nick is a decent guy. He'd lend him money at eight or 9%. Uh, so we'll create a peer-to-peer -peer lending market. And of course, that market is described by definition is a many-to-many -many market. It's a bunch of individuals looking to borrow money and a bunch of people looking to get a better return than their, uh, their shitty uh, bank balances uh, at, uh, at Citigroup. So that's many to many. So, and the argument was, it's just a marketplace market. It's winner take all, all of the data is going to be super valuable because the more people you get on there, you're going to be able to know more about Alex's real credit profile. You're going to be able to price it better. And once you price it better, you're going to attract more people and more virtuous circle, blah, blah, blah. Problem is, the real source of folks who want to get a return instead of having it in your, uh, uh, having it in your, in your bank balances already exists. It's called Goldman Sachs and all the big private wealth managers who have aggregated all of the supply of people who want to lend folks like Alex money. And on the other side, there are companies like Credit Karma and Lending Tree that are aggregating all of the people who are hard up because they uh, spend a little bit too much money uh, given what they make and uh, are looking for a little more credit. And so actually you think it's a many to many market, but actually all the people in that business essentially sit between a handful of big guys on one side and a handful of big guys on the other side. And frankly, in almost every consumer business, everybody has been disintermediated by Google, right? So you're, you, you're I mean, a, a, another, a great example of a fabulous network effects business is TripAdvisor. So TripAdvisor, you say, I mean, it's got all of the reviews, it's, it's, it's great, but how do they make money? Right? They make money by, by, uh, by connect, by getting uh, uh, hotels to, to, to uh, advertise on them. But the problem is you've got on one side Google, which is where people come to TripAdvisor from. And on the other side, you've got Expedia and Booking, which has already aggregated all of that diffuse, fragmented hotel real estate. So you're sitting in between Google on the one hand and Expedia and Booking on the other. Trust me, you're not going to take that much out of the, out of the pie. 
and they don't. That's why it's a small cap company. So yeah, let's let's talk about some of the the you know large cap companies and and you yes. know, part of your book you know talks about Fang and and really goes each into each of those um, companies and you know one of them that I thought would be interesting to start with is Netflix and you you say that Netflix does not have network effects which is something that we would we would agree with you on and actually uh, I, I, I think Reed Hastings basically agrees as well I mean he, he's unlike a lot of these folks who are who I mean the best the the, the the best thing about Netflix is it's got an incredible management team uh, and they're and they're not pimping uh competitive advantages they don't they don't really have it's a retail business it's not a network effects business in this it, YouTube is an is a platform right YouTube is connecting content creators with content viewers Netflix is a retail store. It makes content. It licenses content and sells it. Uh, that's that's a retail business. Not a it's, platform. They're not a platform. It's the like similarly like Amazon. The first almost ten years of its life, it was not a platform. It was a retail business. It's only when they created the marketplace business that it it's became a platform, platform imposter. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. That's right. Well, and I think that's really what, you know, one, I think one of the, the points that you make really well is, you know, all these companies try to say they're platforms, uh, Netflix included. So, you know, Peloton tries to say, you read the Peloton S1 the, or the WeWork S1, right? I think WeWork listed yeah. like yeah. 80 times the platform word. So yeah. a lot of these platform imposters, which Netflix does, has done a very good job masking themselves um, but yeah, we would, we would absolutely agree. There's, there's really no, there's, there's no supply side network effect. There's no demand side network effect. That is, I mean, that network effects the demand side, uh, scale on the supply side, actually, it does have significant fixed costs, right? So there, Netflix, uh, um, you know, the fact that you need to have, you, they, they keep upping the bar for how much fixed costs you need in order to be have a competitive, viable product in right. content in SVOD actually is an advantage to them. And it's that connected with their recommendation engines, their customer captivity and all of that. That's what makes it, you know, an OK business. Unfortunately, <laughs> when you it's a very well run business with some competitive advantages it is unfortunately however <laughs> uh it, it's uh, being competed with by folks who have more money than god and don't seem to care uh, i mean when you're number one when you're number one and they are number one by by a margin and you've got over 200 million subscribers and you've after 10 years of over ten billion dollars of negative cash flow, you finally just broken even. You would think by that point everybody else would have gone away, but they haven't. Uh, you know, in the, just the last two years, they've gone from having fifty percent of the subscribers to twenty five percent of the subscribers. That doesn't feel like there's a lot of barriers to entry, particularly if all it costs to enter is for people like Apple and uh, Amazon. Disney, Comcast. I mean, the list just goes on and on and on. And, and now they're raising prices, which also seems peculiar. Doesn't mean it's a bad business, just means it's certainly not uh, winner take all, or certainly not even winner take most. You, you, you would imagine that there will be a an equilibrium eventually where there are two or three broad-based ones and then a bunch of niche ones. But man, there's going to be a lot of blood on the streets between here and getting to there based on the level of commitment uh, that uh, that people have. And frankly, uh, some of the inanity of the public markets who seem to be valuing, you know, based on subscribers rather than based on you know, conceivable cash flow. I mean, a bunch of these businesses feel like what happens is, you know, for the reasons we've talked about, as as you understand, 
there are analog platform business platform business it's not a new it's a new word but the business models have been around forever i think it's it's actually the oldest business model yeah, exactly. well almost there. the oldest but uh, yes uh, uh but but frankly being digital in many instances makes it a worse version of the same model because it makes it easier for people to switch it may it provides more transparencies uh to uh to consumers and so uh it it, it can be a it can be a brutal <laughs> a brutal place uh, to live now let's let's bring that analogy over to amazon so i, I think this will be an interesting one where right they've they've got more linear businesses they've they've got multiple platform businesses i mean mm -hmm. they're just so massive at this point this is one where i think you know again a lot of areas where we agree your analysis of their grocery business not benefiting from the network effects being what we would classify as like very linear um, no really kind of platform dynamic there which i think is a similar point you make i think you also make the point that they're not a monopoly. If they are, they're one of the worst monop I mean, people who running a monopoly uh, and having, you know, 1% margins and, uh, and in parts of the, lots of parts of the business, I think clearly losing money. If, if they're a monopolist, they're one of the worst ones uh, uh, you ever, ever saw. And the reality is they are really good operators. So uh, it, it's pretty hard to, uh, to believe they are. And if you go vertical by vertical, um, it's, it's obvious from just a market share that they are, they are not. And, you know, the, the big, the best evidence against this notion that these businesses are all inevitably just going to take over the world is <laughs> their desperate fascination with just buying up competitors. I mean, these people aren't stupid. You don't play whack-a-mole, uh, um, uh, if, if, um, if you were going to, if you were going to just take over the world naturally, you wouldn't want to have to buy Zappos or diapers or uh, or uh, I mean, I'm sure they would love to buy Wayfair, uh, but antitrust wouldn't let them. But the question is, if they were a monopolist, how how does a Wayfair exist? How does a how does a uh, a um, what's the pet one? I mean, the that that uh, yeah, Chewy. I mean. I mean, if, it, if this is like a magical monopoly business, I mean, this is basically pets.com for the current age. It's like a $30 billion, $40 billion company. It's crazy, right? Um, so uh, they are obviously not a monopoly. But in certain categories, in certain categories, they have a truly compelling offering because once they layered on the platform business, the marketplace business, onto their retail business and were really as innovative as they were to say, you know what, I will forget the innovators curse. I'm going to compete against myself. I'm just going to put it all out there and I'm going to let people choose. They can buy the retail business. They can buy the stuff that I have in the warehouse or they can buy a marketplace. They can compare, they can choose because as, as Airbnb learned, the more choices that you have, the more likely somebody will transact on your platform. And that makes you the winner. And so that in categories where comparing new with retail actually makes it a more compelling, really more compelling offering, which is not every category. I mean, there are some categories where you're interested in, you're just going there for the new one. And there's some categories where you're just going to look for the used and having it all there just makes it clutter. And remember, but but in those categories where they are, it's pretty compelling, their offering. But they're competing with people who are pure marketplaces, who don't have any of their cost structure, and they're competing with people who are pure retail, who, uh, you know, who often, because they don't have complicated warehouses, can offer more SKUs faster, uh, depending, again, on the product. So it's a tough, they're in a, it's a tough business. They do a good job. But it it is it's a complicated, difficult business. And through the eyes of the consumer, you know, I, I there might be areas that we differ, but generally, I would say, yeah. In the eyes of the consumer, you could say, hey, there's optionality, choices, ups, there's ups and downs, but a lot of value to the consumer. What about in the eyes of the producer? What about in the eyes of those marketplace sellers? 
those third party sellers, right? That is where I don't think there's anywhere near the amount of optionality, variability, much more lock-in, much more control exhibited by an Amazon on those third-party sellers as compared to, you know, say the other side on, on kind of the consumer aisle. Yeah, so that's interesting. Uh, so, you know, the, the existence, uh, uh, the emergence of Shopify has, I think, changed that somewhat in terms of people being able to create other. And, and look, there are very few people who are just on Amazon, but there are categories and folks for whom Amazon, you know, may represent the majority of their sales. And in those cases, they've got a lot of leverage. There's no question, no question uh, uh, about it. Um, but so there's no so that so that is the case. Although it is interesting, that's not everybody. Uh, and as uh, these antitrust proposals, uh, and to me, the the craziest ones. I mean, some of them make perfect sense. Some of these, some of them make perfect sense. Some of these guys have engaged in a lot of bad behavior. Some of that doesn't really have that much to do with the antitrust laws. It has to do with the fact that we're not enforcing other laws or we don't have intelligible laws like in privacy at all in the first instance. Um, but the, the one to me that is the nuttiest is the one that basically says uh, that innovation I talked about of being able to put retail alongside marketplace so that a consumer has the full range of choice, uh, that's illegal. You've got to separate them. Now, if there are two versions, there's one extreme version that just says you can't have them in the same place. And that obviously does nothing for consumers, but it does indeed do something for competing market, pure marketplace businesses that can't uh, uh, help you can, uh, help you can uh, contrast their offerings with uh, with retail offerings like an eBay. Exactly. Uh, or or some vertical marketplace or what have you. That's correct. So why the government needs to, to protect eBay or, you know, as a, and hurt, make the product worse, uh, I don't know. The other version is that it, it simply says, well, you can't have basically, you can't have Amazon basics. Amazon can, sit, can buy stuff and keep it in their warehouse and they can sell, uh, you know, they can sell Nike sneakers and other, but they can't then also have a, a sneaker marketplace or, or they have to do one or the other, but they can't make Amazon basic sneakers and sell those. And they've defined the folks who this weird rule would apply to in such a way that it only captures Amazon. So Walmart can keep on making Walmart basics and D'Agostino's can have D'Agostino, you know, chocolate or whatever, but just Amazon can't. And that's just wacky. Now, has Amazon done a bunch of horrible shit where they stole a bunch of data from people who are their marketplaces and used it to, you know, to, to make a competing product? Yes. That's not about antitrust. That's about theft. <laughs> and, and there should be laws. There should be laws about how you, uh, uh, there should be laws about that, but it's not really an antitrust law. And that's because an antitrust law is looking at, you know, for someone that has, you know, majority market share, are they taking advantage of the customer, right? And, and so that's where very often we talk about consumer, consumer, obviously that's a customer. The interesting thing uh, as we look at platform businesses is we actually think that they have two customers. We would treat that producer, that seller as a customer. And that was interesting. If you remember that House Judiciary report that they put out maybe a year, year and a half ago, they got a memo right from Amazon's actually internal documents it was effectively saying hey our sellers are also our customers and they're really important to our success and and so i think that starts to kind of pull on this thread to say well you know are they taking advantage of a consumer uh, varying points of view but are they taking advantage of sellers and do they have a majority of market share when it comes to 
you know, 3P marketplaces that, that sellers could sell on. And I think that starts to become a very different frame of conversation, which is not as good for an Amazon and, and I think does start to label them as monopoly. I make two points there. First, uh, this I just don't know the answer to. Uh, I have no doubt that there are some number of uh, Amazon customers who are the B2B customers rather than the B2C customers uh, who uh, feel uh, taken advantage of or, or, or feel exposed because they're basically just selling or mostly selling through uh, Amazon. That said, I bet that there are many, many other small businesses for whom Amazon is a, is a lifeblood. There's no other way that they would be able to uh, aggregate demand in that way. And in fact, I promise you that uh, Amazon's lobbying efforts against the proposals that I just talked about will very much involve aggregating groups of sellers who say, if you do this, you're going to kill and hurt my business. But that's separate from a, but I, I think it's important. The fact that yes, a platform tends to have a B2B customer and a B2C customer. The fact that antitrust laws are focused on consumers, they're not focused on customers, they're focused on consumers. And the fact that uh, they have leverage with respect to their B2B customers, the antitrust laws as currently conceived, only care about that to the extent that you think that it will have a knock on negative effect on what ultimate consumers get with in terms of their breadth of product offering and their pricing. Uh, so they do it, it explicitly. In fact, there's a bunch of case law that uh, is, says- Is it just on consumer? Yes. I think it's because you could have a business it's, customer all the same that's taken advantage of. If the business customer is the consumer of the product, not so it, it is not it, it, the the uh, there's a line in one of the famous cases is that it's it's meant to uh, it's meant to protect consumer, not competitors. Right. That is so. That, so when a competitor complains, you know, that they're uh, they're not they're not in, they're not interested in that. So if if the, if they are a um, conduit in a multi-layered marketplace, if they're a conduit from somebody in a multi-layered marketplace, they're only going to care about what comes out the bottom. Now, sometimes the buyer at the bottom is a business to business customer. They would care about that in terms of the, the, uh, uh, the, the product, the uh, product pricing. But ultimately the reason they care about that is because if it's, exp if that input then is more expensive than an ultimate consumer is going to end up spending, uh, end up spending more for the product. But I do think it's important. Now, the, the complaint about antitrust law is that it is being it has been misinterpreted to be way way too narrow by f focusing on the, you know, on consumer welfare, on consumer benefit. Um, you know, things like innovation, which is something that people take into account. You could argue that that also you, know, you can still think about that in the lens of ultimately, if there isn't innovation, that's going to hurt the consumers in the, the long run. That really d doesn't involve fundamentally changing the antitrust laws. But there is a more radical view that my former uh, my former teaching partner at Columbia and now the head of uh, the National Economic Council's uh, Competition and Technology Policy. Tim Wu takes the view, uh, I think, uh, and some others in the administration take the view that, I mean, his his last book was called uh, 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 The Curse of Big The Curse of Bigness, having stolen that from my book, The Curse of the Mogul, but I don't, I don't, I don't begrudge him that. Uh, that is that big is bad in itself, not just because just thinking about consumer, even broadly with things like innovation, but just being big means these folks are going to have too much influence in the political ecosystem and in the world, and that there is 
public policy reasons that have nothing to do with consumer welfare that justify us breaking them up. I think that's a uh, kind of a little bit out there, honestly. <laughs> I mean, I'm happy with broadening the concept of, of consumer, but the the idea that, you know, just because you're big, I, I think it's really important, particularly in businesses where getting bigger actually does make you more efficient, <laughs> does actually make the product better, uh, does allow you to innovate on a continuous basis in a way that you wouldn't if you were smaller, uh, you know, intentionally making product worse like you do if you say, oh, your marketplace can't be on the same page with retail. I think once you are starting to intentionally degrade product quality in the name of the public interest, uh, I think you need to have a really good reason for it. You're saying it's all about protecting the consumer. I mean, when, when we look at, uh, you know, ultimately what Microsoft got in trouble for with the browsers back in the 90s, right? I mean, you know, if we think about a, a different form of platform, but still a platform monopoly taking advantage of the suppliers being other browsers, other kind of app developers, right? Which then ultimately disadvantages that end consumer. But I do think there's a lot of parallels to say that, you know, this isn't just looking at kind of an end individual consumer when it comes to disadvantaging as a monopoly. And if I'm a browser, uh, you know, my, uh, um, Netscape uh, app developer in the 90s for Microsoft, I am also a customer of that platform to give me distribution and, you know, my livelihood, right? So you don't think that factors in at all when, when they think about the Microsoft case? I don't. I think ultimately, the, the only to the extent that by doing that you've uh, you're gonna you're going to stifle innovation and you're gonna ultimately uh, uh, diminish the number of options available to ultimate consumers that's why they will care about that they won't care about it because they feel bad for that company they care about it because they believe that by doing that by allowing that to happen uh, you are going to um, uh, you're going to both, uh, you're going to stifle uh, innovation and uh, diminish uh, the, uh, uh, the choices available uh, to consumers. I think that ultimately that is going to be, that's the legal basis for it, not because of the injury to, the, to that business. The supplier, the producer. Do you think that's the right perspective to take on it all, irrespective of what, what the actual letter of the law takes? I do. I think. I think at the end of the day, what you should care about uh, is um, uh, is whether or not uh, you have a vibrant competitive market that that uh, generates good product at a at a good price. Uh, it is, uh, you know, and and there are a lot of things to balance to to get there. Um, and in particularly in businesses where you have real scale advantages, I mean, the, the truth is, though, that scale advantages tend to top out. Um, that is, after a certain amount, you know, the break even market shares are rarely more than 50 percent. Right. That, that's where you want to get scared. <laughs> now, you know, Google search is an interesting counterexample. I mean, that is Google search just keeps getting better. Every time it sees what I click on, it it, it gets better and better at what it's going to serve me, uh, at, both in terms of advertising and search results. Um, so th which is which is a which which makes it a complicated case <laughs> in terms of how to deal with it from a uh, from a public policy point of view. I mean, the Apple case is, a, is such an interesting, uh, the, the case against Google, to your point, the reason they picked that case is not because it's the thing that affects consumers the most. It's because it's the one case they can win. And why can they win it? It's just the Microsoft case all over again, right? It's the browser case, right? You're uh, now, and so they think we're gonna win. But ask yourself, it is the best search engine. <laughs> you know, if they don't make it the default anymore, 
you know, does it, are we making the world a better, I mean, it's certainly going to have an impact because there's like whatever, $15 billion of 100% margin of cash going to Apple for this, which is not going to be there anymore. So it, it has an impact there. But in terms of consumers, it's sort of hard to, you know, it's of all the things to go after, it seems like not that. Certainly the best search engine to, to sell ads on or for, you know, to monetize ads. But I mean, when you're talking about your TripAdvisor example, right? I mean, they've now um, exercised such an insane toll against all their, you know, third-party websites and crammed all of them down. Many cases, you know, taking some of their content for themselves and ripping that into their search results, you know, to what end, right? And yeah, I think eventually you add up that taking advantage of, of the supplier and you say, you know, there need to be limits against, against, it's not all about the consumer. And if I give everything away to free to the consumer, it's a tall order to say, yeah, the consumer isn't ahead on this deal. But to what end when you look at the business makeup of the economy? Or, or even, I, I, I mean, you know, in those cases are complicated too, because they do know a lot. They do know when I write, you know, Cincinnati flights, what I want, right? And and so they can friggin' tell me where the next five Cincinnati flights are, or they can make me, you know, click on somebody else's thing, and I and I have to eight, do eight more clicks. Obviously, one is better for me than the other. But if we let that happen, at some point, there will be no innovation, right? That we can't trust them to do that forever. But let's take something even simpler. And I haven't actually, I should know this, but I don't. If I, if I want to think about, I mean, I do think Google is a special case because I think it is, in, I think search in a weird way is a natural monopoly uh, because it does keep getting better. And so there is another way to go, which is to say, you know, let's just make it a regulated utility and we're going to put some constraints. Like uh, to me, if you look at the search page for when I put, you know, Cincinnati flights, you look at it today and you looked at it 10 years ago, the page today is a friggin' disaster, right? It is like, four natural search results and adds up my wazoo to the right, to the left, and to the side. It's just, it's it's obviously a less good experience, but it's still better than anything else. So I don't, I mean, honestly, I, I don't know if there are constraints on this, but to me, in lieu of all this other stuff, I mean, just in the same way that um, it wasn't a law, but in the old world, the TV networks sort of agreed only this much advertising. It, it wasn't a law, but you, you only did four four minutes in a half hour or whatever whatever it was. I mean, basically saying it's too much clutter. You know that uh, y y y you're the king. That's fine, but on any page, only X percent can be ads. Just to just make that a freaking law. I mean, I, I, to me, I mean, let's just go right to what is the problem. The problem is the, the, the product has gotten shittier, not because they're not, don't, it's for, as my experience, simply because they want to get more money out of it. And uh, so uh, let's just basically put limits on how much, <laughs> how much of it can be ads and let them optimize around that. I mean, don't change the antitrust laws or, you know, about, oh, we're going to do, you know, shift the burden or it's going to be, you know, you know, something that's going to make lawyers rich when they while they litigate it for the next 30 years as to what it what the difference between a material difference or a significant difference or whatever. Let's just say, OK, you're a friggin natural monopoly uh, and keep doing it better. But within these constraints. These are the guardrails. And that's what was done on, you know, Ma Bell, AT&T of, of yesteryears, right, was for the utilities that you were mentioning was to say, hey, look, there are certain protocols you have to abide within. You can't kick people off just willy nilly. You have to give service. Interconnection is an important concept. And, and some of the legislation is around that, which is, which is super important. And, and, you know, the, all, uh, 
the, their arguments on the other side is, oh, you know, it's going to hurt the service. But that Ma Bell used to, to say in the old days, you know, th their argument was nobody else should be allowed to make a telephone because it's going to, you know, it could it could screw up our excellent network because unless it's one that we made so that it's going to connect elegantly, uh, you know, a bunch of it is nonsense. Uh, so that is super important to make sure and again, both for innovation as well as competition. And actually, where you see that playing out, particularly with Google, you know, demonetizing websites, if we talk about kind of uh, uh, Facebook kicking off uh, creators, YouTube kicking off creators, if we talk about content censorship these days, right? I mean, those kinds of rules would also uh, hypothetically protect producers and creators you know, it's gotten very political these days, but we've had people on the show years ago, pre-COVID, that were just talking a lot about crypto on YouTube, and YouTube didn't like it. They had hundreds of thousands of subscribers, and boom, kicked them off. All their videos gone, all their subscribers gone, right? And and how are we helping to put some guardrails to say, no, you, you know, you have to provide service because you are a monopoly, and you can't just kick people off and prevent them from being able to disseminate their opinion well that's well remember remember that's where they it, that, that that there you're getting somewhere very very tricky because of the little thing called the first amendment right so where these guys all started was actually exactly that they're like we're like the phone company that's like suing the phone company because i call you on my phone and i plan a bank robbery and you don't stop it uh right they, they, they we're not we're just in the business we're just it's open to anybody and they actually liked that idea because then they're not a publisher. They're just a, you know, they're just a tech company, a facilitator. No liability. Yep. No liability, right? It's not my problem. But the problem is it is their problem and it has to be their problem because the government under the First Amendment, it's not censorship unless the government does it. It doesn't violate the First, the first Amendment is, is a constraint on what government can do, not on what people can do. So the government can't go in and say, no, you can't put cyber, you can't advertise, you know, false. You can, there are certain things you can do. There's consumer uh, on truth on certain things, but that's not what people are focused on. People are focused on a whole bunch of other things, which are, which are exactly the kind of gray lines that the government isn't allowed to do. So it will ultimately need to be regulated by the by these companies themselves what how, how we set that up whether we do something that looks from a governance point of view like the bbc uh in terms of uh it, i mean that from a governance point of view uh, it, that is so it's it's kind of a little bit government but it's independent so it doesn't fall afoul of the first amendment uh it's it's a complicated difficult thing you can't you can't say it there's only two people who can decide the company <laughs> the company themselves or the government first amendment limits how much the government can do you hate the idea that these companies are deciding given the, their power their 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 influence that they get to that they get to decide it that's right so so you you got to come up with some kind of quasi uh, governance to deal with this specific uh, this specific issue um, and I mean I, and I think it's got to be something a little bit creative and there look there are some private companies out there you know there's a very interesting company called newsguard which kind of which gives you a red yellow green uh, where they it's a little bit tech but mostly it's very low tech which is people like look and they do research and you can click through if you want to know why it's a red and they have a bunch of criteria but they're a company and guess what F Facebook doesn't use them Google won't license them right Amazon won't Microsoft actually does license them but you know I I, th I don't think it's going to be a problem that's going to be solved by uh, an independent uh, innovator like NewsGuard. I think we will have to set up some structures that we will have to have funded, not by the taxpayers, but by these folks, uh, which will have some kind of complicated governance that will 
be highly uh, controversial, but but will serve this uh, serve this role. Hopefully, they do better than Facebook's own Supreme Court has. <laughs> oh my gosh! Yeah, yeah. But uh, but actually, the other but uh, if we just leave it to them, the other point there is there's actually some pretty interesting and important research that again I know it's not the answer we want shows that being huge does at least allow you this is an expensive and difficult problem uh there's a guy named matt genskow who used to be at chicago i think he's at stanford now did really important research in the 2016 election but looking at twitter and facebook and twitter didn't have anything like the financial capacity to try to clean this up and yes facebook didn't do a good enough job at all but when you compared it in terms of how much money was spent and how much improvement happened it was night and day facebook was far better far be invested far more maybe they didn't do it the right way but the reality is scale gives you the ability at least to uh to address this if you're a small a small guy you can't even begin to try to address these kinds uh much less a small guy who's you know, who doesn't make money and is relying on venture capitalists or whatever, you're not going to spend a huge amount of money making sure that this isn't a problem. To be clear, I, I, I think you need less censorship, not more. And, and if anything, you're seeing a flight of users away from these big content platforms because I think they've become way too onerous with their censorship. And it's actually, I think, a big strategic misstep that they've allowed other competitors to get tens of millions of users that I think that's right if they had not been so aggressive they wouldn't have scared it's it, it's a pain to switch yeah and to leave and go elsewhere so it's a pretty high switching cost that they've now you know made that a much easier switching cost for tens of millions of users which is odd and i i also think there it's more complicated in terms of thinking about if you think about who's going to fund something like this, if it's something that's sort of quasi independent, but you know, uh, uh, who's got an interest in this? I mean, the number uh, of brands who are advertising digitally uh, through programmatic and, and otherwise and advertising on sites that they have no idea, which include, you know, hate, fake news, all kinds of stuff. You know, they should they should have an interest just in terms of their own brand reputation in coming up with a solution, uh, a solution to this problem. So I, I think I think there's got to be a way to uh, impose essentially a tax on the people who are going to obviously the companies themselves uh, and uh, and, but also the people who are going to benefit from it, which are the which are the uh, which are the brands who are who are using these uh, to uh, to reach customers. Jonathan, it was a pleasure having you on today. Uh, author of the Platform Delusion, uh, really appreciate the time today, and uh, we hope to have you back soon. Great, thanks so much for your time. Real pleasure.